everyone. Welcome to Access Chat. Today we are going to be talking about transportation and I'm joined by my co-host Antonio Santos and Neil Milliken is flying home from uh, Seattle, Washington, so he's not going to be joining us. Um, today we have Lamandre Pugh, who actually happens to work for my company, which is such a blessing that he agreed to join my team. And he is our chief sustainability officer, um, but heavily engaged in every aspect of the inclusion of people with disabilities. He also has his own podcast, which I'll let him talk about, um, which is Five P's. And of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or 17 of those Sustainable Development Goals. They also have five purpose goals, and that's why his uh, show is called Five Ps. And he's very focused on, you know, how do we make the world work for everyone, climate change, how that's impacting people with disabilities, and other uh, diversity and intersectionality of diversity. and things like that. So we were very honored to have him on the show today. So um, Lamondre, let's start out by, if you could just tell the audience a little bit about your background and where you came from and also your your 5P show, and then we will start the conversation um, that we had a conversation before we started this about transportation and some recent things as well as um, the transportation that's working and the ones you know that's not working, the ones that are working, and then they make decisions that they're not working as well, things like that. So let me turn it over to you, to Lamandre, to introduce yourself. Absolutely. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having me as your guest. It is absolutely a pleasure uh, to be with you today. Um, Lamont Dre Pugh, who am I? I guess I guess that's where we'll start at. Well, I, I am uh, born and raised in Columbia, South Carolina in the USA, and uh, I am the Chief Sustainability Officer for Rural Global Impact. And um, I've been an advocate for people with disabilities for a very long time. Uh, in fact, I always say when I turned 18 on my 18th birthday, I experienced severe culture shock when I was released into the world and I realized that it was not necessarily the fair and equitable place that I was always, that I always thought that it was. And uh, during that time is when I really started uh, advocating, becoming politically involved and, and dealing in advocacy and, and, and both systemic and individual advocacy. Um, I was one of the first students mainstreamed into a public school system in South Carolina. I wasn't the first, but there was a major wave uh, that came forward uh, in that. And um, I was asked to speak at a meeting when I was about 13 to discuss what that experience was like. And it just kind of snowballed from there. And that's really when I began advocating and uh, and becoming really involved in the community. I do have spinal muscular atrophy, which is a form of muscular dystrophy. Um, and basically I have the same functional limitations as a person who may have quadriplegia. Uh, for example, I can't um, I can't walk, I can't bathe myself, I can't feed myself. Um, however, it doesn't stop me from doing anything that I really want to do. And uh, and and the example of that is I, I really have no desire to climb mountains, but I have every desire to move any barrier, including a mountain that stands in my way. Uh, and so that's the approach. That's the approach uh, that uh, that would take from life and. Honestly, a part of my mission is to help people realize that life is wonderful and help people live on purpose and to help alleviate the barriers that may that may exist, whether they be real or whether they be imagined, whether they be built or whether they be are, are, are attitudinal. The idea is that we help break barriers. And that's one of the reasons that I created the show 5P with Lamandre. It's my podcast. And those five P's are people, planet, peace, uh, prosperity, and partnership. Those are what those five P's uh, stand for. And they are in line with the 17 sustainable development goals that the UN have put out. In a nutshell, the show is all about people doing positive things to make the world a better place. And it doesn't have to be where these are people who are doing monumental things, but they're just doing what they can do in their corner of the world with their passion to make the world a better place. And that is what the show is about. That's what I'm about. And that's one of the reasons that I love working with Root Global Impact, because that's what Root Global is about. It's about making the world a better place for all people. And so that was a quick uh, synopsis of who, 
and what I am. I agree. I, I and I think it's very important to, to help people understand where you came from. And so, and you do a lot of talking about the intersectionality of disability and other diversity groups too, which I think is very powerful. Um, today we wanted to talk about transportation, and I know um, that you, you know, have had some recent uh, troubling transportation experiences. I know oh, that yeah. um, there, uh, Scott Rail um, is in the news and that being chatted, um, tweeted about quite a bit because one of their trains, um, their first class trains, they have. Um, you know, upgraded it so it's even more luxurious, but um, they it's no longer accessible. So you, if you're a person that is in a wheelchair, you can't use it. Now, a point that Antonio made before we went on air was that the good news about Scott Rail is they are more accessible than a lot of the other train systems, and we're going to talk about that. But also, as the community is really criticizing them for doing this, and is it a slippery slope? Are we going down the wrong direction? Is it okay to have one train that doesn't accommodate people in first class with disabilities, but all their other trains do? It, especially when there are so many train systems that don't that are not accessible, is that a slippery slope? But at the same time, I want to point out something Antonio said before we went on air. Scott Rill is actually engaging in these conversations on Twitter, so we do want to applaud that they are willing to go in and have the tough conversations. And Antonio, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, and do you also have a question for um, or comment for Lamandre? Um, you're on uh, as, you know, as you know, we, we do we do uh, we have been doing a a access to Dublin with Janice uh, Valentine in Dublin for for a couple of years now, and mobility was always one of the one of the main topics, and it was always a a, a difficult one um, in Ireland because you know you, if you want to go anywhere, you almost need to call 48 hours before going, so it's a very 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 difficult situation if you are a student no if you, you know if you are just at home bored I, I just want to go from a to b and you just realize that you have you should have remembered that two days before you know no that's that's not fair uh, it's basically is not you know, that goes against your own uh, human rights of, of of independence so i think it's important to address the topic of mobility, but is also to, important to those who are there, who sometimes are unable to speak or even unable to complain, and and they are in a very precarious situation. That's always something that that concerns me. I, I can give you an example, a story that was breaking this week uh, in in the Portuguese national television about a 10-year-old visually impaired boy that was living in a small town in the north of Portugal. And every more, uh, so uh, the Portuguese government is taking care of his transport. So he travels every morning, a huge uh, uh, to a school that is really, really far from his home, uh, and then he needs to return at the end of the day because that's where he has a teacher that can help him with his uh, within school, and he's doing really well in school, uh, uh, even some limitations in terms of uh, in terms of technology. However. When he is at home and he wants to get out, all the infrastructure around him is not accessible. So his mother needs to go with him because you know it's the, the lights uh, that are not in the right place or the cross or the footpath is not adjusted uh, because they don't consider people disabilities at all. So uh, I know that Lamont has tra traveling and he faces these issues every day. So I think it's very, it's very important to get his uh, views about uh, things that he's experienced on his, when he travels, but at the same time, also looking at the people that sometimes work for organizations or for systems or for companies who don't really, uh, are not really accessible, but they, the people, are doing the, the, the best effort to help and sometimes overcome some of the difficulties that that the uh, the, the physical side uh, doesn't doesn't help them to, to to support individuals that need to move. Yeah, yeah I, be I believe that it is certainly a multifaceted um, 
a multifaceted issue. Uh, and, and, and let me say, let me say this first. Transportation is one of the major issues that people with disabilities face across the board. Um, transportation really equates, in many instances, to freedom. It, 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 it translates to independence. It translates into learning opportunities. It translates into commerce. In fact, it impacts every single area of our lives. And, and let me also preference this by saying, my position is always that people with disabilities should be involved and included in every aspect of life. There is no place in life where because I am a person with a disability that I should be excluded from. So that is the preference, that is the perspective uh, that I will present from because that's what I believe through and through. Um, and you're right, there are so many different, there are so many different elements that come into play when we're talking about making uh, transportation accessible for all people. Uh, and, you know, there are many barriers that come into play. Sometimes it's a, it's a physical thing where maybe the dimensions were wrong or maybe there just wasn't the right seating or maybe it was too high or the platform, all of those kinds of things. But the thing that I realize, and this is why, this is why I do the world the way that I do. The thing that I realized that the only reason those things are the way that they are is because someone, some group, some entity did not take the resources, did not take the design, did not take those essential elements into consideration as it relates to accessibility in the inception of those things. So what I've discovered is really the biggest barrier to accessibility and to inclusion for that matter is attitudinal. And yes, we applaud the folks, we applaud the people who are willing to step outside of the systems and do the very best that they can to make certain that people with disabilities and other people are able to access those services uh, in, in, in whatever way that they can. But it still goes back to the central theme of if people thought about it differently, if people put accessibility in the forefront of, of their design, of their programming, even where they allocate the resources, then it would cease to be a problem. And this is one of the reasons why I applaud Scott Rail for engaging in the conversation. I applaud Scott Rail for having the other trains accessible. We must hold them accountable for thinking or even probably didn't even realize that there are people with disabilities who do want to enjoy the extra luxurious uh, elements that first class has to offer. And there are people with disabilities and their family members who can indeed afford it. So while we applaud them and we want to work with them to correct this, we want to work with them to get this right. A part of being a real friend, a part of being a real partner, is to guide you when you're wrong and support you when you're right. And this is what I believe we as a community have to do. Antonio, can can you talk a little, I'm sorry, Antonio Lamandre. Uh, I know that you recently um, went and spoke um, at, uh, at Lilly's. Uh, and I remember, um, which is a wonderful organ, you know, pharmaceutical company and stuff. And I remember you had some really significant transportation issues there. And I was just, and I remember that the people at Lilly were just really surprised and shocked about what happened because, you know, sometimes you, you just don't understand when, you know, it, it's a hassle for me to travel sometimes. It's a hassle. I miss a connection. I do this or do that. But I haven't had some of the experiences you had, and I know they were really shocked. So me, I was right. just thinking, yeah, I thought that might be helpful if you would just explain some of the barriers you've recently experienced, and maybe we could, you know, use that as a continuing conversation. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I, I, I love to travel, and I travel quite a bit. Uh, we speak all over the country in different parts of the world, even sometimes. So planes, trains, and automobiles were constantly in one of those, uh, in one of those forms of transportation. But when I can, I, 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 I like to take um, trains or buses. And the reason is, is because I don't have to get out of my chair in order to access these forms of transportation. 
And typically what that means when I arrive at a city or in a state or at, at the destination, I also have to arrange transportation in order to get me around that particular city. And I'm usually really diligent in terms of scheduling things ahead of time and making certain that everything uh, is accessible. So this is what happened. I had scheduled once I arrived uh, in the city, which was Indianapolis, which is where Lily is headquarters, uh, Indianapolis, uh, Indiana. Uh, when I, before I arrived there, I had set it up days uh, in advance for a cab company to pick me up from the bus station because we wrote the uh, bus this time, from the bus station and take me to the hotel. Well, the first thing that I was told was that, uh, well, you can't call that far in advance just because, you know, schedules change and we're not sure what time the bus is going to be there. So give us a call about an hour before you get into town and we'll make sure we have a cab there for you. I said, no problem. We'll definitely do that. So I called about an hour prior to us arriving there. And this is what I was told okay, uh, we're going to try and call and get someone there, um, but, um, but, but you'll be here in about an hour. I said, yes. All right, so about maybe 15 minutes later or so, I got a call saying, uh, we're really having a problem waking him up because it was super early in the morning. <laughs> we're really having a problem waking him up. So just bear with us. We're going to make this happen. Long story short, we arrived at the bus terminal. No ride was there. It took an additional two hours and 45 minutes sitting at the bus station before a ride came to get me. And when the ride came to get me, dropped me at the hotel, and I was paying him because I was still paying for my ride. He did pick me up, so I was still paying for my ride. The driver then looks at me as he's taking my credit card and says, are you going to include a tip? And I said to him, you picked me up two hours and 45 minutes late. And before I realized it, I paid the man, gave, got my car back, and I just moved away. And the reason that I had to do that was because it would have been things that came out of my mouth that my mother would not have been proud of. So, uh, and he, the, the, the interesting thing about that, that was not the only issue. So, of course moving from going from the hotel to the event site was also a transportation issue there were times literally when when the 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 the, the actual event site itself was only maybe about a 10 minute drive away from the hotel but it was still too cold and too hilly to actually trek there to actually walk there so we certainly had to have transportation because this is in indianapolis in the dead of winter which is really cold uh, here in the U.S. So walking was not an option uh, there, but we waited the day before because typically what I like to do is I like to go to the event space and kind of physically see the space and absorb the energy and see what's happening uh, in, in the space. So we went there the day before and again had to wait almost three hours outside of the event space in order for the transportation to come pick me back up. And of course, the folks who were our hosts there, the folks at Lilly, they were shocked. They, they didn't realize that. So the next day was the big show. The next day was the show that we had to be on stage and do this incredible event. And I have to tell you, Lilly was amazing and the event was amazing. But that, the next day was the big show. And so it was imperative that I was there on time. It cost me $100 to go less than a mile down the road in order to guarantee that I would be there on time. And even after it, you want to go and, and you know, network with, with, with newfound colleagues and friends and supporters, couldn't find the right to get me to dinner. But here's the beautiful thing that happened. And this is, this is one of the things that I think is important for all of us, particularly in the disability community and even those who are not necessarily a part of the disability community, but see what's happening in the community. Lily rose up because they understood and they realized what was happening. You know, this was an eye opener for them. They began to coordinate advocacy efforts in the city of Indianapolis to change the transportation situation. So the beautiful part that really the beautiful part about that story is 
not only was it an eye opener for them, and they did everything that they could to help me in that situation, because not only was it good for LaMondre, remember, I'm a paid speaker there. So it's good for them. It was good for them as well. But they realized that they are a corporate citizen in the city of Indianapolis and that they have a voice. And while disability transportation or accessible transportation may not be at the forefront of what their issues is, because they recognize they could have pull in that situation, they put their weight behind it. And they're doing things to change that in that city now. So that's a testament to how we need to come together. And, 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 and sometimes organizations, they think them or HR departments, they realize, oh, nobody in wheelchair ever apply for a job here. I wonder why. Well, right. may, may, maybe they have done the diligence and they realize, well, I can't really go there because there's no way for me to get from my house to so it's better not to apply. At least I save myself from all that awkward. We well, you know, Antonio, it's almost like this. Would I go and sit and wait for a bus I knew I couldn't get on? Would I go and sit there and wait for a form of transportation that I knew I would never have any access of getting on the bus? Absolutely not. So what ends up happening is you, you don't see people in those spaces. And this is what I mean exactly about by, by the whole Scott Rail example. If you make it inaccessible, no, you're not going to have people with disabilities using those services. It's simply not going to happen. But if you open it up and you make it accessible to everyone, you open your possibility. You open up the market. You open up your customer base. You open up the goodwill. You open up yourself to making advances and making discoveries that you would not have had before, but simply because you did not allow a certain group of people to access it. You see, I believe our strength lies in our diversity. I believe the fact that we're different and the fact that we, the fact that we have different perspectives and different opinions and different ideas and different abilities is one of the things that makes us so strong. Because if everybody had exactly the same thing, we would only strive for exactly the same goals. We would only seek the exact same discoveries. But by having a diversity of opinion, by having a diversity of views, this allows us to broaden and expand and see things that we've never seen before, hear words that we've never heard before, and have experiences that we've never had before. This is why I always say, if you make things accessible for people with disabilities, you make it better for everyone. So it opens the doors for everyone. I agree. And I say that too, I, because the good thing about accessibility is if you do it right, it, it makes it accessible for everybody, but it really draws in the innovation and the creativeness, inclusive design. Inclusive design is for humans and humans right. are these diverse, you know, there's such beauty in our diversity and uh, there's so uh, many never. different. Yeah, go ahead. Over, over the next couple of weeks, uh, uh, we have seen a good number of articles on that matter on the Financial Times and on Bloomberg. And, yes. and I think, you know, we're not talking, uh, uh, we're talking about mainstream media. Uh, 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 so it's, I think it's, per, it's particularly important that this type of news and reports reach, uh, or gonna reach this type of media because they are the ones uh, who, who are more broadly read by everyone and can have an impact on decision makers. Absolutely. I agree. I agree. And I think it was a good point that you made, Lamandre, where you're saying, you know, Lily, Lily's a pharmaceutical company and they're a great company. Um, they are. I love Darren Rowan in the UK and you have Andrea here in the US. They're, they're amazing. They're just amazing people really committed to uh, accessibility and inclusion and diversity and inclusion across the board. But they really stepped up to say, wait a minute, we can do better than that. And there are so many other corporations that are stepping up. And now we have all this artificial intelligence and we're talking about smart cities and transportation is a really critical part of that. And I know um, I was blessed to work with LaMondre at my former company, Tech Access. And LaMondre, I'm gonna say this and probably incorrectly, but I know that you're in a motorized wheelchair, which is a much, much heavier wheelchair than uh -huh. a wheelchair that's not motorized. And 
I know that those motorized wheelchairs are very heavy. So when you would travel um, on airplanes there, and I, I wasn't familiar with what this was, but I remember you needed like a special ramp to make sure it could accommodate the chair. Uh, and there were just things about getting you from A to B that I wasn't having to think about with other employees as an employer, but at the same time, you are such an amazing team member that I accommodate you because of your brilliance. I mean, you have wow. so much <laughs> of value to add, but even if you weren't, if you were a crappy employee, I still as an employer <laughs> need to do the right thing. Right. But, but I mean, it's worth it to me, but, but at the same time, I just don't realize some of these issues. I mean, I hear about them and I know that, some of um, the Access Chat community, they they were pinging me saying, Deborah, did you see what's going on with, you know, uh, Scott Rail and, you know, they're making their first class more fancy, you know, dancy, but taking out wheelchair accessibility. Now, what I didn't realize, Antonio had told me, what it, it was only one of their trains. And if I have, it, it still is a slippery slope to me. It still worries me because, do you make something more luxurious at the expense of cutting out members of your, I mean, your passengers and your, okay. your passengers, families and friends? I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so, scary? so my, my, my answer to that is no, because I am a part of that community as well. I should have, if I can afford it, I should have access to that community as well. So that's going to always be uh, my position uh, that you keep it, accessible and you can be luxuriously accessible those things can coexist they are not mutually exclusive they certainly can exist together and in terms of in terms of travel um with me in terms of flight with me it's not so much that i needed a special ramp but what it is is the chair is extremely heavy and it's delicate and what happens is whenever i'm taking out taken out of the chair what would inevitably happen is when they would stow the chair underneath the plane, they would break it. Um, but they would break it not because not because it was so delicate. It was just because they didn't handle it correctly. They didn't know how to turn the brakes off, which is fine. I could I would I would label everything. I would you know write notes, and usually they got it. But I remember sitting in the plane, looking out the window, and seeing my chair turned upside down. On a conveyor belt, my thinking is, wait a minute, it has wheels, it has brakes, why is it upside down? Why is it upside down? So there are certainly things that, that I have to do and prepare for that will help to mitigate some of that, uh, some of that, um, some of that damage that could happen. And so I started doing things like disconnecting the hand control and bringing that as a part of carry on with me and also clearly labeling and clearly marking how to do certain things like literally i i came up with almost like a almost like a paint by color system a paint by number system uh for my chair just so that we would have a lesser of a chance of the chair being broken or damaged in any way and what's interesting particularly in the u.s um they would say things like well you know if we break it don't worry about it We'll pay for it. We'll make sure it got fixed. My thinking is, okay, that would be the equivalent of me saying, if I break your legs, don't worry about it. I'll fix it. I'll pay for it. Don't worry about it. But but your legs are going to be broken uh, for a little while. Uh, so it's it's it, it's it, it took a while. It took a while, but things are things are slowly starting to turn a little bit where people are paying more attention to it. But the question that I have is why do I have to transfer out of my chair to get on the plane? There's room. There's certainly the opportunity to do that. So it makes no sense to me why the laws state or why the laws are written in such a way that I have to get out of my chair. I don't have to get out of my chair on a train. I don't have to get out of my chair on a bus. So why is it that on the plane I have to get out of my chair? The space is available. It's there. You know why? Because as a society, we don't have the will to change it as of yet. The collective will that is simply there not to change it. So my thinking is, and, and this could be just the optimist in me, is that we can change this. 
We can do something about this. We just have to keep talking about it, keep pressing for it, and keep advocating for it. I believe that there is th that that we can do anything if we have the will to make it happen. If we can put people on the moon, if we we can do this. This is th right. this is th this really is not rocket science. Well, you know what? In China, over the weekend, they built a thousand bed hospital over the weekend in China. Wow. I also want to say, and then I'm going to give the mic to Antonio. Um, according to an article um, in May 2019, new data shows U.S. airlines damage about 25 wheelchairs per day. Per day. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Antonio, let me give you the mic. I was going to say at least three of those chairs were mine, I promise you. <laughs> no, I've been in a few um, public transport events over the last couple of months, and one of the things that that seems to be getting into a trend is about uh, seamless mobility. What does that mean? It means that you are able to somehow define your journey in one place. So you are planning to, to travel to, let's say, to Paris, and between the place where you are and Paris, you might end up using four or five ways of methods of transportation. And through those systems, you are able to book, and then uh, the app is able to follow to the journey, and you are able to, to manage all the transfers and all the transfers and all the transport in one place. What is in some cities and in some operators, they are accessible, so you can expect that, but others are not. So my question to you is, when you are defining your journey from, from traveling, could be a long travel, could be a short travel, when you are using systems to booking, how much time do you have to spend uh, to, to doing that, that booking to be able to travel? Are you spending you no know, a day, half a day, just to make sure that everything fits according to your needs? Sometimes it's a multiple day event, uh, simply because, you know, they're, they're, I have not found an effective system that denotes whether something is truly accessible or not. That kind of encompasses all of them. Like, I, it's not like I can go um, to, you know, Travelocity or some website like that and say, okay, yes, I need accessible this, and, and, and it kind of checks it all across the board. So what ends up happening a lot of times with me is once I book the primary source of transportation in terms of how I'm going to get there, I then have to go and check out that city to see what services are available there. And typically what happens is you'll find, you know, you, if you type, you know, accessible transportation, a whole list of things will come up that really are medically oriented. And so you have to call each of them and contact them and explain exactly what your situation is. And many times, organizations like this don't work on the weekends, so you have to wait until someone's in the office and returns your call. Um, so it can really be a logistics nightmare to coordinate this, because the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to arrive in the city and realize that you don't have transportation to get around. Now, I will tell you what's amazing, though. I was recently in New York. I was actually speaking for Bloomberg. Um, I was in New York and had a situation where I had a taxi service arranged, prepaid them, prepaid them, by the way, had them arranged. And when I arrived there, I took the train. When I arrived in the city, uh, we are going to be there in 15 minutes. 30 minutes later, no ride. An hour later, no ride. An hour and 15 minutes later, no ride. And each time I called, they, oh, we're going to be there in five minutes. We're going to be there in five minutes. Inevitably, it got to the point where I realized five minutes would never come. So I started seeking other transportation options, and someone just said, try Uber. And I remembered, I remembered that Uber did have a program called Uber Wave, wheelchair accessible vehicle. And being in New York City, if it's available anywhere, surely it will be available in the heart of New York City in downtown Manhattan. So I pulled up my phone, opened the app, and sure enough, there was Wave. A Wave vehicle was available. I tapped it, and four minutes later at the corner, a wheelchair-accessible vehicle pulled up. We jumped on, and we were able to get to the hotel. And needless to say, I used Uber Wave everywhere I went while I was in the city. 
from that point on. Now, here's the thing. Why did that happen? Because Uber and the city of New York worked together. And New York literally said that if you're going to operate in this city, you must have comparable services available for people with disabilities. And guess what? Uber wanted to work in New York City. And so they made that happen. And here was the only caveat that came with that. The gentleman, the driver said, yes, typically we're here in about six minutes. He said, the only thing is, if it's after 11 o'clock at night, you may have to wait 10 to 15 minutes. <gasps> Tragedy. Think about it, 10 to 15 minutes? That's amazing. And what that tells me is, again, it was about the will to get it done. It was about Uber saying, you know what? New York is valuable to us, so we're going to make that happen. And that's what happened. The, st the city stood up and Uber responded. And I believe that if cities, if towns, if countries, if people would simply stand up, the entities will respond. Right, right. And it is part of the smart cities. And we, we also were talking about this off air. This is not just about making sure the train is accessible, the, the lift, the, the, you know, the airplane. This is also about the airports and the train right. stations. And, and I know that and the um, toilets. I'll give a shout out. They right. have toilets. Oh my God. Great point. Um, I'll do a shout out to Ambassador Gallegos of Ecuador. Um, they are so committed to it that they built one of the most accessible, innovative, creative airports in, um, in the world, in Ecuador, because they really wanted to make sure that it was accessible to everybody. So I agree, it's about the will to want to do it. And as as you know, Antonio mentioned, you know, it, that's a huge issue, whether or not you get to go to the bathroom. And, and sometimes, even if the toilets and the bathrooms are accessible, there's not enough time between your flights. Because I know that when I fly all the time, um, they will say, if you're a person waiting for a wheelchair, just wait till everybody gets off. Well, sometimes it takes forever for people to get off the plane. And so then I've heard, you know, my fellow travelers say, then Deborah, I don't get to grab a snack before the next flight. I don't, I'm lucky right. if I get to the next flight. So right. what is that about? And that's impacting our older citizens too. So that's also very short-sighted. I know that Antonio had mentioned that off air and it's a really good point. No, it absolutely is. It's an amazing point. And, 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 and just to give you some, some, some idea of when I talk about a, a systemic and attitudinal change, you talk about the bathrooms. We talk about, you know, bathrooms being accessible. Well, let's talk about a different element of accessibility. Well, you know, there are typically men's restrooms and there are typically uh, uh, female uh, women's restrooms. Well, me, even if it were fully accessible, it wouldn't really matter because I have to have someone to come into the restroom to help me. Well, typically, I travel with females. I travel with women. And am I going to take her into the men's restroom or am I going to go into the ladies' restroom? Well, what that means is that we probably need to have some unisex restrooms or family restrooms where two people of different sex can go into the restroom. And that's a hard thing to find. That's really right. a hard thing to find. And so what ends up happening is typically I end up in a lot of women's restrooms. I do. I end up in a lot of women's yeah. restrooms. Now, for me, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but I know it's also uncomfortable for a woman to see a guy with a full beard, uh, you know, <laughs> in, in the restroom with them. But what are my options? What are my yeah. options? So again, that boils down to really just that, that's an attitude. That's not a physical structure thing. That's an attitude. That is a that is a, a a construct that is simply a part of the human imagination. That's a limiting factor to accessibility. So we and really also, have to expand Antonio, the definition of accessibility. I, mean, I agree, and I keep calling you Antonio. I don't know why, Lamandre. Another thing I know that, and I'm going to forget who it was. It was a. Um, 
I can't remember who it was. I think it was a sports figure um, in the United States. And he was saying, you know, I want to be able to take my little boy or my little baby, my baby into the bathroom. And I don't want to take my baby and have to change them in the nasty men's urinals. That's weird. And so give us family bathrooms because it allows fathers. And yes, our fathers love our children. I'm my God, Antonio, you and your daughter are so cute together. I mean, Fathers want to take care of their children, too. So by having these family bathrooms, it also helps men that want to take care of their babies, men that are traveling with their little girls. They don't want their little girls going into, you know, so it's right. good for everyone. And, you know, it, you know, it, and it makes just so much sense. I, I like what you're saying in that we've got to have the will to make this change. We've got to have the will. Right. We've got to care. And we got to have the slippery slope. And once again, I agree with something Antonio said off air in that we appreciate that Scott Rell is actually willing to engage with. And there's a real heated conversation going on about, you know, what they did with their first class. And they didn't include people with disability, anybody that's a wheelchair user. But um, this is a really important and a very complicated topic, a topic as well. And um, I know that we are almost out of time. And uh, I want to make sure that we thank our sponsors, that we thank our, I should say, our supporters, Barclays Access. We love, love, love them. We love My Clear Text to make sure all of our videos are fully captioned. We just appreciate everything they're doing. And Microlink is so wonderful to us. And then our community. But we really do appreciate your wisdom too, LaMondre. And we need to really dive into these very complicated topics because I think you're right. We, it's a part of it is, do we care enough to fix these things? Do we care enough to say, we appreciate everything you're doing, but what are you doing here? And by the way, when you make things more accessible, it's gonna improve the experience for all of your customers, including customers that are temporarily uh, disabled. But before, I wanna make sure we give you the last word, LaMondre, but before I do that, let me give the mic back to Antonio in case he wants to make some comments and then we'll let you have the final words, LaMondre, but we appreciate what you're doing. Over to you, you, Antonio. No, I think it's it's really a very, it's very a, a, a complex issue and and, our, and we if we want to solve problems, we need to uh, embrace uh, embrace that, that level of, of complexity to, to, to have them done. I think, uh, I see things, uh, changing uh, and in, in terms of uh, public transport, in terms of mobility, they are not still changing as fast as we want want them to change. Um, but one thing that is still concerning me is particularly in the, when we talk about smart cities, there's plenty of events happening around the world. And this discussion about accessibility in mobility is being discussed, but not yet with the seriousness that it deserves because smart cities are projects that we're talking about large investments a lot of money are being spent sometimes we are talking about taxpayers money and once the spend is being done and then you realize that you need to retrofit we are talking about taxpayer money again so i think it's particularly important that uh, people start to look at uh, uh, at the way how these cities are planned uh, and consider accessibility really, really early at the stage of planning, not just at the middle stage, because you know, in the, in everyone will benefit, uh, including the taxpayer. And you don't because you also have you need to have the taxpayer on your side when you when you want this type of developments to take place. Good point. Good point. Let's turn it, give you the final words, Lamandre. Tell us what we can do to fix this once and for all. And as Antonio said, it's a very complicated, these are very complicated um, issues. They are, they're, they're very complicated and it's with, with a ton of nuance uh, to it. But let me first start by saying thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Access Chat for um, for allowing me to be a part of this discussion, and it's a very important discussion. As I evaluate where we are in terms of including people with disabilities or, or the, this whole spectrum of inclusion, this really is about do we have the will to get it done? The biggest barrier I believe that people face 
are attitudinal barriers. Because if our perception of things were different, if our attitudes about accessibility and inclusion were different, we would design differently. We would allocate our monies differently. We would think of whatever we're creating, whatever programs we're doing, whatever services we're providing, we would think of them differently. We would think of them in ways that include all people. See, I, I believe that this is not just about ramps and wheelchairs and braille and sign language. I believe this is about creating a world where people actually belong, where people actually fit, where there's a sense of, of we're in this together, that this is not for them over there, or this is set aside for this special group over here, but we're all a part of this human experience. And I believe that if we begin to push and if we begin to drive in that direction, I believe justice and I believe equity and I believe peace will then bend towards us. And then we can all experience that. It is no good thing that I'm ahead and you're behind or I have access and you don't. That is not a good thing. That's not, that's not what we should ascribe to because I believe that if one of us is left behind, then all of us are behind and we can't move ahead until we all are moving together. That's what this accessibility fight is about for me. That's why I do what I do. That's why I'm willing to share my voice. That's why I'm willing to share whatever insights and whatever experiences I have in order to make that happen. And guess what? It's not just about disability. Because yes, I have a disability, but I'm also an African-American man born and raised in Columbia, South Carolina, the heart of the Bible, but in the cradle of slavery in the United States. But guess what? We have the will and we have the ability to change all of that. So I am always going to fall on the side of hope. I'm always going to stand on the side of justice. And I believe the idea is to create a world where we really belong. Thank you all for the opportunity to share it. I appreciate well it. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. And we miss Neil on this, but um, we will see everybody on Tuesday. So thank you, Lamandre. Thank you so much, Antonio. And we um, we will see everybody on Access Chat on Twitter. Thank you. <laughs>